get going here in just a minute. There's this like nice awkward pause while we wait for uh, Facebook Live to roll. Well, if it's any consolation, there's someone in their underwear on the roof right across from me walking around <laughs> yelling, yelling into their cell phone. So I have plenty of entertainment. <laughs> hey, oh, good. <laughs> There was just a lot of yard work by me. A lot of like, a lot of <laughs> aggressive leaf blowing, which seems to happen in the twilight hours. Aggressive leaf blowing. Good. Well, welcome. I am Manuel Aragon. I am the community engagement manager for Lighthouse Writers Workshop. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are joined by a Colorado native and a former Lighthouse faculty. First, before we jump into our reading tonight, I just want to thank everybody. Um, we Lit Fest 2021 went live yesterday and we have received like a lot of excitement, a lot of exciting emails and folks visiting the website. So thank you for just checking that out. Um, we really appreciate it and especially you know the, the past year has been odd and so we're, we're glad that you have stuck with us so our two readers tonight we're joined by I'm going to spotlight both of them just so you can see them so we are joined by Eric and Joanna and Joanna will be reading for us first so Joanna Lowell lives among the fig trees in North Carolina where she teaches in the English department at Wake Forest University. When she's not writing historical romance, she writes collections and novels as Joanna Rocco. Those books include Dan, Another Governess, The Last Blacksmith, The Week, and Fieldgrass, co-authored with Joanna Howard. As Joanna Rocco, she's also taught courses for years at Lighthouse, which have shaped her writing across all genres. So I'm going to go ahead and spotlight you and take us away from the uh, spotlight. And then you can tell us what you're going to be reading tonight. All right. Thank you. Um, and it's so exciting to be virtually back at Lighthouse. I, I put on a Western shirt. I was so excited. Um, I spent five years in Denver. Um, and uh, teaching at Lighthouse was, you know, some of the, you know, some of the, my greatest memories are from that mansion um, in the background there that you can see. Um, and I, I actually learned a lot about writing romance um, teaching in LitFest. I taught um, a course for a couple of years called The Secret of Steamy Scenes. And um, it, was, it, was a, it was a sex writing um, workshop. And it definitely gave me um, sort of renewed energy for my own romance novel project. So I'm going to read um, from The Duke Undone. It's the very first time I've read from it. It's um, a historical romance set in Victorian London, and it follows a painting student at the Royal Academy of Art who stumbles upon a naked man in an alley uh, can't banish his beautiful form from her mind, paints his portrait, the portrait, um, she's forced to sell it due to her uh, straightened financial circumstances. The portrait goes out into the world and um, the, the subject himself uh, comes upon it uh, and is not pleased and he's a Duke. So um, it, charts, it charts their love story. Um, so um, I will read uh, a little bit from um, the very beginning, the, the prologue, which um, sets up the encounter. And then I'll skip ahead and I will, um, I will read of Lucy, the heroine's first uh, encounter with um, the Duke awake when he's come to the Royal Academy of Art, searching for the painter of the scandalous portrait. Um, only he thinks the painter is uh, a Mr. Coover who's a visitor in the, the painting school and visitor was a term used at the Royal Academy. Um, it meant the instructor or the teacher. So he thinks he's looking for a male instructor and he's unaware that um, the woman he encounters is in fact um, the painter. And the book just came out on Tuesday. So it all feels very new and exciting. So this is the prologue, London, October, 1881. 
As Lucy Cooper turned into the narrow alley, her eye caught the patch of early morning sky peeping out between the tenements, violet paling to softest blue, the silver moon still floating above a single rosy cloud. Her fellow students at the painting school would never believe the slums of Shoreditch could offer such beauty, but how to capture that quality of light. She held up two fingers and focused on the span between. Still gazing upward, she took another step. Something beneath her foot crunched. Not mud, not refuse, dear God, there was a hand beneath her boot, the hand attached to a wrist and the wrist to a forearm, the forearm to an elbow, the elbow to an upper arm, shoulder, neck, head. She had trod on a corpse. Lucy sprang back. The feel of fingers grinding beneath her heel made her stomach plunge, but the corpse didn't stir. Well, a corpse wouldn't. There he lay, stretched before her. She felt her heart pounding in her ears. She could hear the street sounds and see between the bowing walls a sliver of morning life. Omnibuses and donkey carts rolled along, hemmed in by the throngs. Every morning, Lucy hurried past crumbling tenements, crossed through grim, teeming courtyards, and squeezed through this passageway, a shortcut to the high street, where she caught the omnibus to the Royal Academy of Arts. She'd stepped on her share of rotten onions and once a rag that squeaked and discharged a rat. This was something new. She steeled herself for another glance. Ah. Poor soul, he'd been deprived of life and, she swallowed, every last stitch of clothing. Shoreditch teamed, teamed with street toughs notorious for theft and murder, knocked him on the head perhaps, stripped him of coin cloth and shoe leather, dumped him in the passage to rot. Her skin prickled as it turned to goose flesh. She whirled around, but no one loomed behind her. This had to be the loneliest alley in all of London. She turned back slowly. How strange this feeling that she and the corpse occupied their own little world, a quiet pocket in the clamorous city. The busy street was so close, but the passers-by kept their eyes down or fixed straight ahead. For help, she would need to send up a cry, murder. And yet her gaze dropped again. The corpse was beginning to strike her as remarkably vital. Surely murder most foul never left the skin with such a ruddy glow or the limbs arranged with such casual insouciant grace. It felt wrong to stare, but she was after all trained to stare. She lowered her bag to the ground. She drew her brows together and gave the corpse a long and steady look. One arm was bent behind his head, the other was flung across the broad expanse of his chest, a chest that was almost imperceptibly rising and falling. He lived. So I'm gonna jump ahead. Um, and now we're at the Royal um, Academy of Arts and Lucy is alone in her classroom. It's the break, most of the students are at the canteen down the hall and um, uh, the Duke has arrived. <laughs> a man filled the doorway, tall and broad and dark. He didn't notice her flush. He didn't pay her any mind at all. He was glancing around the room, already shifting his weight to move on down the hall. With a start, she recognized the ratio of shoulders to hips, the staggering breath of the former accentuating the leanness of the latter. He was somehow taller even than she'd imagined. Although his height made perfect sense given his length, when sprawled upon the ground, his verticality astounded her. There could be no doubt. My corpse! The words burst from her. Hysterical laughter threatened to follow and she clapped a hand over her mouth. The man whose body she'd spent months daydreaming, drawing, realizing in every detail and oil and pigment until she'd breathed life into the form and had begun to think of it, of him as her own creation. He was suddenly scant yards away. His dark brows arched as he turned back to her, my corpse. His voice had the unmistakable drawl of the best society. I am unfamiliar with that expression. He was looking at her as though she'd sprouted two heads with a mix of curiosity and revulsion. She saw herself suddenly as he would see her, short and scrawny, frizzy haired in a vivid dress of purple silk and black brocade. To make it, she wedded components of gowns her aunt had sewn for two very different productions, a music hall melodrama and a Shakespearean tragedy. She felt her flush deepen. 
Her attire was interesting, but not outrageous, not by art world standards. Kate wore trousers and Redcliffe Davis wore an earring. This man did not hail from the art world. His suit was plain. The wools and linens were of the highest quality. His jacket and trousers were expertly tailored. If this was his typical attire, no wonder he'd been stripped to the skin. A family could dine off the buttons alone. She swallowed hard. She remembered the heat emanating from his body, the smell of sweat and spirits. This man was clean shaven. He wore his hair combed back. She knew already how he would smell, perfumed, wealthy. Nights when she lay down at last but couldn't sleep due to her racing mind, she'd imagine meeting her corpse again. Silly fantasies. He was always wearing rough clothes and he always recognized her as though from a dream. He was a farmer, a blacksmith, a gamekeeper. She'd conjured all sorts of country professions. He was never this, never the gentleman, imperious and disdaining, the sort of man who would always be a stranger. She shared nothing with him. Her sense of connection had been exposed in a heartbeat as an absurd presumption. It was ridiculous, but she felt betrayed. Only students are allowed at the school, she said too sharply. Perhaps you are lost? He brushed the suggestion away, dismissing it, dismissing her. I'm looking for someone. And although there was no one in the room to find except her, he stepped across the threshold and began to prowl the room's perimeter. His stride was athletic, lazy and sure. She stood rooted to the spot, staring. In her picture, she had styled him classically as the shepherd king Endymion, but here in the flesh, his fluid grace made him seem predatory, a poor fit as a protector of small defenseless creatures. He moved like a panther. The visitor in painting, he closed in on her, eyes sweeping over the uneven ring of easels, the model's chair in the center of the floor. Do you know him? They were green, those eyes green as moss, but without any of the softness. They were hard, clear, startling. She'd never have guessed that exact shade. How to convey its brilliancy. Pale green lights added to darkest emerald. She looked too long. Suddenly his gaze grew piercing. He was staring back. Of course I know him, she said. Her mouth was dry. She could look at this man for a year, for a hundred years and never grow weary. He did not feel the same way about her. His eyes slid away again easily, turning to more interesting sights. He circled an easel, Susan's, and leaned over it, peering closely at its contents, then returned his eyes to Lucy with a sniff. I don't see the likeness. He folded his arms at his chest. She knew how his biceps curved, how the muscles swelled. She could make a map of his veins. Likeness? Her comprehension had lagged behind the words, but now she snapped to attention. Likeness to whom? Her? Ha! She tried to access her reservoir of scorn, which she could usually rely on to resource her lavishly when she interacted with arrogant men. He would be the type who took a woman for an artist's model rather than an artist proper. Did he even know this was a female class? That women painted at all? What devastating set down could she deliver? He strolled to the next easel. Ah, he said, this one too has nothing of your face or expression. Mr. Coover is a poor teacher. She choked on the phrase she'd been preparing. What had he said? Mr. Coover? Her heart seemed to stop completely. And then it sped up, not beating, but whirring like the mechanism in a sewing machine. The visitor in painting, she said slowly, Mr. Coover, good God. Um, if her corpse was asking for Mr. Coover, visitor in painting, that meant he'd talked to Mrs. Forbes. That's the person who bought the painting. Um, he'd seen the picture. Understandably, he wanted to confront the artist. He wanted a word with Mr. Coover. Cold sweat was breaking out across her brow. Mr. Coover, Lucy said again, groping for what came next. It is he you hope to find. The green gaze fixed her again, scrambling her thoughts. Her corpse gave her an ironic smile. It is not a hope. But an inevitability, he said slowly, as though doubting her wit. We have important matters to discuss. Her panic mounted. She focused on a point above his left shoulder. Then I hate to bring such tragic news. What was she saying? She listened to the words issuing from her mouth, as much a spectator as the man she addressed. Mr. Cooper is dead, has died, just the other day. Another corpse. Damn it. She didn't dare look at his face, terribly sad, she continued. Were you very dear friends? My condolences. 
These sympathies, which took her completely by surprise, seemed to warrant her bestowing upon the bereaved a kind and forthright look. She risked looking up at him, lips pressed into a sad smile, a mistake. His brows had climbed again, and his expression did not encourage further compassionating. She glanced toward the door. I really must be going. I'm wanted in the canteen. We're taking up a collection for the widow. Damn it. Damn it. How very kind. Her corpse approached. She had no choice but to look at him. He was so large and so close. She'll be solaced, I'm sure. It was quite unexpected. Very much so. Her voice continued smoothly and she marveled at herself. Her mother used to scold her for telling tales and it seemed she hadn't lost the knack of it. He was sketching in a field, what were they called, with animals? She knew nothing of the countryside firsthand. A pasture, she said. He was consumed with his work and didn't notice the danger until it was too late. He was trampled by cows and a bull, gored and trampled. That should finish him. She shuddered at the pathetic scene, cows rearing on their hind legs, blood staining the clover, peasants in the distance pointing, the fatal moment captured in the style of Gainsborough. It's a great loss for the academy. He was watching her closely, too closely. How much better she liked him when his eyes were shut. Now, she said briskly, shall I show you out? You really aren't allowed to be down here. The policy is terribly strict. She made for the classroom door. If she can get him out of the building before he asked any questions, there was a chance that all would end well. She looked back. He hadn't budged. She raised an eyebrow and tipped her head, smiling to encourage him. Her corpse seemed to come to some independent decision. In four strides, he'd reached the door and extended his elbow, offering to escort her. Forgive my discourtesy, he said smoothly. We haven't made a proper introduction. Her response was automatic. Lucy, she began and stuttered. A proper introduction would hardly do in the present circumstances. Uh, Miss Lucy, she said. She touched his sleeve, trying to keep the pressure of his fingertips so light she would only feel fabric, no hint of the flesh beneath. Weston, said her corpse. She yanked her fingers up as though burned. Maud's excited voice purred again in her ear, the Duke of Weston. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'll take you up spotlight. So, whew. but thank you for sharing that. Our next reader, we are joined by Eric Roschke. Eric received an MA in creative writing from the City College of New York. His first novel, The Book of Samuel, was translated into Italian and nominated for the prestigious Prince Award. His short stories and essays have been published in among others, The Atlantic Monthly, The New York Times Magazine, Hazlitt, Georgia Review, The Volkskrant, and Guernica. His short story, Winch, was nominated for the 2018 Best American Short Stories. His second novel, To the Mountain, was released in February 2021 from Tory House Press. As a reporter in the early 90s for the newsletter in Belfast Telegraph, Eric briefly covered the violence that marked the end of the Troubles. He also worked as a Peace Corps volunteer in Armenia and a certified New York public school, and as a certified New York public school working with lower income students in the upper Manhattan Bronx area. He currently teaches writing at the University of Amsterdam. Eric. Hi. Well, first of all, I want to say that, that last reading was really fantastic. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for reading. It was, uh, it was nice. I've been listening to uh, the audiobook of Middlemarch. So it was with these sort of weird sort of crossovers, which was super nice. But um, <clears throat> I, uh, I want to read. Um, I'm in New York right now, so sorry if there's background noise, but I, uh, my book is about um, a father and a 12 year old boy who's autistic who gets lost in the forest during a snowstorm. And his father has to find him. And uh, my oldest son, uh, who's now 14, he's autistic. And the main character is entirely based on him and uh, my living with him and, and my experiences. And <clears throat> so we came to this point when I wrote the whole book that I said, hey, do you wanna read the book? And he was like, yeah. And it was a sort of a testy moment because if he didn't like the book, well, he can't read because he's he struggles with reading. But so he listened to it on, on audio. Um, but at the end, uh, when I was like, hey, I have to do some readings, 
what was your favorite part? Would you like me to read something? And he said, yeah, I want you to read the part with the coyote where the main character Marshall, who's based off of him, fights with the coyote. And I was like, oh, I thought this was sort of like the weakest part of my book, but he really liked it. And so I've wound up reading it this whole time. So <laughs> that's the part I'm gonna read. It's his favorite part. So basically what happens is there's a, there's a 12 year old boy and he's in the forest and, uh, and uh, he's all by himself and he has a little doll and he talks to his doll. His doll is his best friend and her name is Susie. So they have this conversation and uh, so she'll come up. And then there's one other little thing I wanna let you know is that there's, uh, when I was trying to describe my son's autism and his tantrums that he would have, um, basically I, I described it as two ways. There's, there's the panic and then there's the fury. So he would have these tantrums and then after he got older and I could sort of see like what's going on, there's this first intense sort of panic that overcomes him. And then it's this anger. And, and so in the book, I've turned the panic and the anger into actual characters themselves that live with inside him. So first he has a doll, Susie, that he talks to. And then he has this sort of animal in him called the panic and the fury. Okay, and now he's in the, he's in the forest in Colorado uh, in the San Juans, uh, uh, Sangre de Cristo's sort of make believe, but it's Colorado and it's winter. <clears throat> okay. Um, all right. Okay. Every so often, the sun would make its way through the clouds and the light would be diffused through the mist. A coyote yelped far away, a pair of high pitched cries like an animal taken by surprise. A few seconds later, there was another yelp, even farther away. The snow blanketed trees, blanketing everything. Whole drifts tumbling from branches. Marshall sniffed the air and caught the scent of decay. It was not human but the kind of scent given off by an oily, unwashed hair. Usually he could tell from which direction the scent emanated, but this scent was scattered through the wind. They came to a frozen lake and a waterfall. The sun was low and a stray ray illuminated the slithering flow behind the ice. The small lake no larger than half an Olympic swimming pool, was covered in a thick layer of snow. Low groans of shifting ice broke through the stillness. In the alcove of the lake near the waterfall, sounds were corralled. Susie stopped Marshall at the edge of the lake and, cupped, and waved her cupped hand in the air. She did not turn around, but hushed him and pointed. A coyote, she whispered. Within a stone's throw, a coyote was peering from behind a tree. Its brown and white mane frosted by a light black fur. It stood uneasily on its legs, back sagging, eyes yellow and crusted. Its coat was clumped and mulching. There were icicles on its mane and sores peeking from its hind legs. Purple and maroon blushes against white skin. The animal knew they had spotted it, but instead of hiding, remained crouched. It was panting, even though the temperature was close to freezing. She looks sick, Susie said. As the animal raised its head, its sunken black eyes focused upon them. Marshall held out his finger and approached. He raised his hands in the air and waved them in the air. The animal tapped its front teeth together, then arched its back, uttering a low, gurgling sound. She motioned for Marshall to back up onto the ice, but the coyote slowly stepped forward, keeping its eyes upon them. They stepped farther out. Marshall knew that the coyote wouldn't follow them out onto the frozen lake. 
animals were afraid of ice. Still, he kept backing up farther than was necessary. When the coyote stepped on the lake's bank where the rocks sloped into the water, Susie sighed with her, sighed her relief. She'll go now. I don't like this, Marshall said. Well, me neither, Susie said. This is our mountain too, Marshall said, glaring. We're allowed to be here. I'm not afraid of this coyote. If it wants to fight us, let it fight us. If it loses, I'm going to kill it. Susie turned and eyed Marshall sternly, but he did not meet her eyes. Instead, he kept his gaze locked on the coyote. We're not going to fight it, Susie said. It's not right, Marshall said. What's not right? We're allowed to be here just as much as she is. If she's sick, she should die. It's a coyote, the doll said. So? She doesn't understand right and wrong, Susie said. Suddenly, Marshall charged the coyote, screaming and waving his hands in the air. The animal hissed and retreated. Marshall laughed tauntingly, then spit at the animal. Susie shouted, stop! The coyote stepped forward again. Marshall jogged backward and the coyote followed, leaping several feet into the air before stopping. Marshall bounded forward, nearly ramming into the animal. The coyote leapt backwards, forelegs skating about, rear legs collapsing on the ice. It hesitated at the edge, not willing to be tricked twice. Marshall stopped as well, far out on the ice. They both stood their ground, eyes reading one another. He waved his hands and the coyote flinched, crouched, touching its chin to the snow. Marshall took a step forward and so did the coyote. Then the ice cracked, water percolated. He lost his footing, dropped to his knees. The ice opened, crack giving way to cracks. Marshall's foot slipped. He dropped Susie and she slid in with the rest of the snow, gliding between the narrow opening. He screamed, thrusting his hand in the lake, but the doll had sunk into the depths of the water. The panic was fully awake, stretching and yawning inside him, flapping its wings and breathing fire. The fury was growling, roiling about in Marshall's body. The coyote rushed forward. Marshall screamed and swung his backpack. The coyote backed away and growled, fangs out. Marshall threw the backpack at the coyote, leapt off the ice, dove into the lake. It wasn't deep, maybe 10 feet, and Marshall swam quickly to the bottom. He caught his clothes on submerged branches. The water pricked, hot and freezing, then hot again. The cold was unrelenting pressing heavily against his chest. He clawed his way back to the surface, treading water and gasping. He saw the coyote rooting around his backpack, picking at the, jer the jerky and apples. Marshall dove back under the water and patted around the back of the rocky bottom. He surfaced, went back under, resurfaced, each time becoming more furious at the coyote's snout it was deeper in his backpack. On the fourth attempt, Marshall found Susie lodged between two rocks. He snatched her body, tiny body, and raced to the surface. When his head was above the water, he clawed for a piece of solid ice, but it splintered in his hand. He grabbed a rock along the shore, but it was too slick. He attempted to pull himself onto an even thicker piece of ice, but it too broke. He was kicking with all his might, but his wet clothes pulled at his limbs. Water flooded into his mouth. Susie was screaming vague commands. The panic roared. The fury squealed. The fury reached out and grabbed the coyote's forelegs. And the animal was so surprised that at first it didn't even react. When the animal realized what was happening, it snapped at Marshall's hand, piercing the flesh between his thumb and forefinger. With several hard tugs, 
Marshall dragged the animal closer. The coyote dug her paws into the ice, but Marshall used his weight as a counterbalance. When the edge of the ice cracked just under the coyote, Marshall knew he had won. He gave her one last hard pull and the coyote lost its footing. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric. I'm gonna bring Joanna back up, spotlight you, add me up here. So thank, thank you both, those, those are wonderful readings. Um, I first wanted to ask both of you, and, and you were talking a little bit about this um, when before we started the Zoom, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of writing between genres and spaces. And, you know, Eric, you've written, you worked as a reporter and have read short stories and novels. And Joanna, you, you write, uh, you have novels and you, you write across the board with works of hybrid. And also I, I wanted to talk to you both about just the writing between various forms. And then Joanna, for you too, also, um, you have the added uh, bonus of publishing under a different name. And so if you could talk about that as well. So, um, and either one of you would like to start just chatting about like writing between different forms and how you decide what goes where and, and all of that. I'm, I'm always curious about that for writers who can do the whole spectrum. Joanna, you want to start? Sure. I mean, I, I like to read a lot of different things. Um, and I feel like for me, there's a, a really close connection between reading and writing. And um, and some of the eclecticism of my reading and writing habits, I think, just come from uh so you're you're in New York. I'm my family's from New York originally, and um we were the we moved from Brooklyn to the country and we were the Italians with the pizzeria. And so I I like grew up in this pizzeria, and there was um uh, a library that was always had a sale on books down the street. And so I would take money from the till. I would like go, I would get a bag of books. The romance novels were very cheap. And so I would just read them voraciously while eating pepperoni on a sack of flour. And so all of that, all of that like reading sort of got into me. And so as I, I went through, um, you know, school and MFA and other sort of academic training, I, you know, I was drawn to, um, surrealist and experimental work and was really interested in trying that out myself. But then I also have this like abiding deep love for genre, which just like satisfies something like pizza, you know, for me. And so it felt really natural, I think, to try that out as, as well, even though I do think there was like a distinction that gets set up between um, the literary and the genre, which I, you know, I, what I, one of the things I appreciate about Lighthouse is that I think Lighthouse does a lot to sort of break that down and show that, you know, you can write in, um, you know, all sorts of modes and, and forms. Um, and I just like pseudonyms. Um, I think they're really fun. And um, there is like, it seems to be like a tradition of romance novelists. Uh, I mean, or, you know, George Eliot, you know, like people using pseudonyms, often women using pseudonyms. And for me, Lowell is a multi-generational um, pseudonym because my mom's family is Greek and uh, my yaya, my grandmother, was part of a singing trio in Lowell, Massachusetts. And they were, um, their last name was Rodopoulos, but they called themselves the Lowell sisters instead of the Rodopoulos sisters because they were in Lowell. And I think it was like a more youth euphonious for the American audience. And so when I thought, oh, I need to have like a, I want to have a pseudonym for this persona. I thought, oh, I can, I can use this pseudonym that's been used by like women in my family. So it just felt perfect. Yeah, I, I, I have to say, I really admire the fact that you write genre fiction and then you write experimental fiction because I think that's really cool. Like, I think a lot of times, like with this book, I learned, um, I worked with a, an editor who was, uh, he was also the editor of The Revenant, you know, that they made the Leonard DiCaprio movie out of, but the book is really good. And I had never written like sort of fiction that really moved quickly, you know, that, that had a story, you know, and he kept saying like, he kept saying to me like, what does this add to the story? And I'm like, well, I don't know. It sounds beautiful. It sounds really good, you know, like, 
it's great sentences. He's like, well, what does it add to the story? I'm like, nothing. And then, you know, I'd wind up cutting it. And I learned really quickly, like there's this whole portion of my life as, right, as a writer that, that I, I can't sort of write. I mean, I think a lot of literary writers think they can just jump into genre fiction and write, you know, sort of like an action book or romance, but it's really hard. Like it's really hard. And so the fact that you're doing two, I think is like, I think is really impressive because it's not like you can't just step into genre fiction and just start writing it, you know? Um, you're taught in school how to write experimental and to write, you know, all sorts of different things, but genre, there's not, I mean, I wasn't taught, you know, here in City College. And it was, you know, it was a lot of people even poo-pooed it, you know, but then you had people who were in publishing were like, yeah, but you can make fun of genre writing, but that's what pays for your literary fiction to be published, you know? So, and I think like you're, uh, you know, you have a similar thing. So I think it's really cool. And I think, you know, anybody who's can do those two things. And for me, like, I think, like I wrote this book because I really like fiction. I would write short stories. If I could write short stories all the time, I would just write short stories. I love short stories. But, um, you know, then you wind up, when you write short stories, you have like 50 people read them. And so it's, it's you know, and that's nice and it's good. And, and of course you can say like, you know, well, I write for myself, but it's nice to have an audience too. And I think with, with fiction and novels, even broader audience and nonfiction too. And, uh, but I also didn't want to write another nonfiction autism book. I wanted to write a book of fiction that was, uh, that sort of transcended the father, my son's autistic memoir, you know, that sort of took, what is it like to have uh, a child who's disabled and might never be independent and is difficult and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What does that mean? And to, to take it to a whole different level. So that's why I wrote fiction for this book, but I mean, I'm not always going to write fiction. I love writing nonfiction too. So, so. thanks, Eric. I, I just want to say, I think it, that that idea that it's like easy to write genre fiction. I, I don't know where that comes from, but I I feel like yeah. that maybe it comes from school or comes from the fact that genre fiction is, you know, considered lesser, particularly romance novels, because it's um, you know a genre that is. Um, you know, primarily written by women, primarily read by women, showing women's interiority as so, you know, patriarchy, but also, um, yeah, it's actually so, it's actually so hard. And I have this really amazing agent, um, uh, Tara Gilsomino, and, and, um, and she went through my, this, this book and showed that like, basically she could cut out like every other sentence you know, and it would still, cause I basically, I, I, I would write something and then I would have another beautiful sentence sort of like extending the metaphor or describing it in the way that maybe a literary fiction writer would, you know, some would, and it just the momentum that you need for genre and the way that you have to work at the unit of the paragraph. I mean, it's, it's like a very particular technique. And I feel like I didn't really learn it either. Maybe you pick it up from, from reading and that there's, there's just such good genre fiction. I'm very like humbled sort of writing romance now and, and trying to get better at it. So I, yeah, I just really uh, resonate with that. And also I'm, it was amazing that you read the, that you read the coyote scene. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, and also the, um, the frozen pond and the, um, the waterfall, it made me think of um, the ice palace by Tarhai Vasas, which is a really kind of amazing book with the frozen waterfall. Um, anyway, just like so much, um, like rich symbolism and beauty in it. So anyway, thanks. I really liked, I liked hearing it. Thanks. I, I but it is, can I ask a question? I mean, I'm just curious because we were talking about this before, like a little bit, like since you have a PhD and then you're doing genre, like where does, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions. But I'm really, I'm actually really curious about this. Like, where does that sort of, is there a dissonance between those two or is it really like, does it all come together in a way, you know, like where you're really studying fiction, but then. Yeah, you, you know, know I teach, yeah, I teach, I mean, I teach creative writing workshops at Wake Forest and I have really supportive colleagues who are, um, you know, I mean, I think, I think you could be in an, an English department where there was much more of a um, sort of stigma around the idea that you're not doing something that seems like 
high art or, or like has a certain kind of like literary cachet or something like that. But I think, I think that's getting broken down by romance as a genre, because I think there are so many, I mean, critics who have been pointing out that like really good writing happens in, in romance. Um, but one of the reasons why I like historical romance is because, um, I, I like to do research and it's also legible to a university to say, I need to go to the Royal Academy of Art and look in the archives for diaries of female art students. Like that's also something that um, sounds academic, you know, and, and it is, I mean, it's like, it is hard, you know, it's, it's research. Um, it just goes into this <laughs> instead of a monograph. Um, and so, um, I mean, there's awesome contemporary romance. Um, maybe it would be slightly harder to convince um, my colleagues in English who are Victorianists that it was, um, you know, a, a project that involved rigorous intellection if, if it was um, something more contemporary. I don't know, I think they'd be open to it anyway. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel different writing the two different kinds of things. Um, I approach it really differently. I don't outline. My, my work that's like more language driven because I just sort of see where the sentences go. You can't, I can't do that for a romance. I like, you need to move people across a room. I think like you were saying, like things have to happen. And in, in other sorts of fiction, I just want to have like a sentence no one has ever written, like words that no one has ever strung together in that order. And in a romance novel or any sort of um, genre fiction where some of it is just moving people across a room, you're just using a sentence which has appeared in other books. You're just moving people across the room. Um, I don't know. I think it. I think it actually helps me think about craft and form. So for me, it's it's pretty synergistic. Um, yeah, that's interesting because I, I had a I had a Victorian teacher when I was in City College, and she said she literally said that during the Victorian times there was something like seventy percent of all printing presses were turning out romance novels, and that there was like a hundred thousand to one hundred fifty thousand romance novels printed within like a 10 year span, you know, when printing was expensive. And that that even during the, the Victorian, like we think of like, you know, all the like, you know, Charles Dickens and all this stuff, but there was this huge plethora of like Victoria romance novels being published, turned out even then. So I think it's really interesting, yeah. And definitely, I think they say of romance in particular that it keeps the lights on for publishing still. Yeah, cool, yeah. Yeah, that was a great question. And, and feel free to jump in if you have questions as we're, uh, I was, as we're going along. I was gonna ask uh, for both of you, both of you teach writing. And uh, what what is, you know, we, we always like acquire like our bag of tips and tricks and things that we, uh, share with other writers as we are going through it. And so what, what, what's, what, what, what's one of your tips or tricks that is like, you know, uh, your, your comfort tip or trick, the one that you go back to or thing that you're like, okay, when nothing is working for me, if I go and sit at this place or go and try to write this thing. And if you could share that with us, that'd be wonderful. You mean like when you have writer's block or like, or just, just, just in general? Just, just in general. I, I can, uh, I could say a couple of, a couple of tips and a couple of tips and tricks. Um, one, one thing is this, and this is part of why I actually write different kinds of, of stuff. Um, I find that working on multiple projects is really useful and having one that's just like, this one is just fun, you know? Cause I feel like the thing that we could psych ourselves out as writers, or there's like, I feel like a lot of writers block or, or like frustration around comes from these like internal, like this voice that's like, is it good? Does it suck? Should I stop? Why should I do this? Um, and so I feel like if we could deactivate that by getting back to that sense of joy or play that we, you know, feel when we start writing or before it matters what we're doing, um, that's really useful. And so, you know, when you're like trying to do the thing, I think it's fun to turn to something else. It doesn't even have to be writing. I think it could be like reading. It could be like baking a pie, just something that makes you like feel like, oh, I like making again. And then I, then I feel like it helps to have energy to go back. 
to the work. I mean, I think a lot of my tips and tricks have to do with um, turning off that um, that sort of like serious voice that's like judging yourself as you go. Um, I also think just finishing something is amazing. Like even if you're like this, I'm gonna this is gonna be the worst thing ever. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna like right through to the end of it. I feel like the first time I finished something, I was like, oh, it's all, I did it. It didn't matter if it was terrible. It was like, I finished this thing. Um, and so I just sort of, yeah, I sort of try to, you know, tell, tell my students to just like keep going and see what happens, get right in end line. And then also just like little things. Like, I think it could be fun. Linda Berry is a, some, somebody who, um, she's a cartoonist and a novelist and has books about craft. And she, um, I put her in the name in the chat, but um, she has um, all sorts of suggestions along the lines of like, just having like a hat filled with words, you know, like nouns and like pick out six of them and give yourself some sort of prompt, you know, things that can deactivate the pressure to have some sort of original like thought, like you're waiting for the muse to arrive. So I don't know, I really like constraint based writing. It's like, if it becomes a puzzle to be solved, I feel like it could be less stressful than like, here I am with the blank page and I must create or something like that. Um, I don't know, those are just some, some thoughts. Awesome, like I, I think, I, yeah, I think that's such a perfect like answer because for it's kind of the opposite of I am, but I think people are like, are these, there's general sort of ideas for writing like or tips, but I think it really depends on the person, you know, like who you are and what you like to write, you know, like I have, I mean, I'm just very, I have to be like bubbling with some sort of emotion before I can sit down and write. And, and I have to be like, I'm walking down the street and it's just consuming my thoughts. And, and that's not good necessarily because what happens is sometimes I write stuff and it becomes so intense, people are like, whoa, you know, but then like, like otherwise, I, I, but I really, I have to feel it. And then when I finish, it's this emotional release. And I think like Colson Whitehead said it and a lot of other writers have said it too, but you know, no tears for the reader, no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader. And I feel like if you, I, I like to write stuff that has an emotional impact. And I feel like I can't do that unless I have some sort of emotional Thing going on with me and and like Jonathan Franzen said this too he was talking about how he had like you know he had hardly any problems in his life and he had a very uncomplicated childhood a very easy childhood and then he has these friends that have all these traumatic stories and and difficult experiences and they're you know sort of crying on his shoulder and the whole time he's thinking like this is money in the bank if I had this you know because because he could just translate it into into a story and so I, I i i think but that's just me you know like that's just who i am as a writer but i know a lot of writers too that are like they love the idea of yeah as you said making something and creating something and crafting it and constructing it and i think that's awesome too you know so like, yeah thank, thank you both uh lynn shared a comment and a question. So Lynn said, loved both of these. Thank you both. Do you have a preference for a certain point of view to write from? And if yes, why that point of view? I'll just say real quick for romance, because um, for other sorts of things I do, I feel like it very much depends on the, the like language environment that I'm creating. But one of the things I love about working in romance is not all romances do this, but a lot of them do the dual point of view. So you have um, both of the, um, you know, the people that might be enemies, but will eventually become lovers. You know, you see inside both of their heads. And there's something about that, um, that I just find addicting as a reader. And uh, a writer. it's just like so fun to get to, you know, know that, know that one, one character is feeling this and the other character is misinterpreting it wildly. And then you get to sort of like see that negotiation. It's also sort of difficult to pull off sometimes. And I think when it, when you don't do it well, it just becomes sort of frustrating where you're like, just talk, you know, or something like that. Um, but I, I, um, I, I love the, the switching. So I know some people now write like first person, like romance, which is great. But like, for me, it's all in close third for the, the two love interests. Yeah. yeah, as I'm listening to Middlemarch, I'm so, I just, I'm giggling, you know, like I'm just, cause it, it she's so good the way she pops from one head to the other, you know, and then their reactions in their heads, 
it's a it's brilliant i mean i'm not I'm saying middle march is brilliant it sounds kind of pedantic but i'm just saying that it's 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 so amazing when you have that you know you're popping around from what person one person thinks about and then other person thinks this and i love it but um yeah i also i i always say like when i'm teaching though i always say it's sort of like an engine of the car like and this is a very i guess a very male sort of metaphor but it's like i'm sorry but it's like you know do you have a four cylinder or six cylinder or eight cylinder like what are you trying to get across and what are you trying to carry with you when you're when you're trying to tell your story is your story about a personal experience or is it about several different people or whatever and then the mechanics behind it so for example my next book um i have a it, it's kind of a romance but not sort of but it's i stick very close but it's third person because it's two people and i stick very close and third person close to the to the narrator which is the the woman but there's still two people so i don't want to say get too too far away from him but it's really about her so to me it just felt natural to sort of really stick to her you know so So it looks like, thank you both. Those are really great responses. Th this is from Philip. Uh, both readings felt so propulsive and exciting. Did you both come to your plots before sitting down to write? And how did they shift or change in the process? Well, I, I can say that my book was 75,000, it was 95,000 words. <laughs> and now it's 37,000 words. So. Um, a lot went out the window and that was basically just a, a, a shaving off of all this stuff to get to the plot, to get to the, the, the movement of the story, as my editor liked to say, so. Yeah, I overwrite for romances as as well. Like they're like they shouldn't they shouldn't be like 160,000 words or something like that, which is what I sort of end up with. But I, I definitely, um, uh, yeah, sort of come up with the, for a romance novel, I, I actually, I like come up with like a sort of a general, like these are the basic obstacles or this is kind of like the sort of, um, you know, I start thinking of like, where are the scenes gonna take place? I sort of, I'm like, oh, okay, there's gonna be, is there gonna be a ball? Is there gonna be a scene in a theater? And then I start linking it together and I try to like make a rough sketch across the chapters and kind of stick things in different parts. But for me, a lot of it actually does come out of the details of research. Like you'll be like digging around and like, you'll find out some like amazing little thing. Like when I was researching about the Royal Academy, like that there were um, like life new drawings that just got stolen one year and like, they don't know what happened. Like did someone steal them to sell at a pub or did somebody um, who is like, opposed to like the moral decay that might happen if we have too many people drawing from the nude, destroy them, you know? So then you'll take that sort of detail and like weave it into something, which I'm, I'm doing in my, one of the other books in the this series um, right now. But some of it is like, yeah, the plot definitely shifts because I'm like, oh, I thought this sort of made sense that a person would behave like this. And, you know, someone reads it and is like, why? <laughs> why is this happening which is kind of a, a neat thing about I never I hadn't had an agent ever before because I write small press work and so having like a, a really good reader say like this doesn't make sense <laughs> it's really helpful um because yeah I think I think that's something like having a plot but then also being willing to like you know like sort of do like one of those magic eye things where you're like could I see this different <laughs> somehow and then you're like oh thank god I was stuck because this didn't work and then you figure out something else so like you know when do you push too hard at the plot you came up with and then realize like oh if I actually like do something else it's it's gonna suddenly it'll flow better so I find like I'm constantly wrangling with plot but I, I do try to with romance come up with it ahead of time and deal with it as I go. You come up with an actual plot before you put it into the, before you start writing it. Mm -hmm. oh. I mean, I haven't ever before, but I do it for, I do it for romance. Um, also, I mean, I know there's a happily ever after. I know, you know, I know certain things, but it's, and I figure out like details and, and then the details might shift things, but I have like a basic, you know, this basic trajectory. Thank you. Thank you for those answers. And thanks for the question, Philip. 
just as we close tonight, Eric and Joanna, any, any uh, final thoughts? I mean, I just want to say thanks. I mean, I, I really like, I love that Lighthouse does this. I know that this year has been really hard and the fact that we're still able to sort of gather and, you know, it's like sort of like gathering around a fire, <laughs> sort of like we're gathering around our flickering screens and still like sharing our ideas and like sharing the fact that we like love to read and write um, and that we can still have community together. It feels really inspiring to me. So I just appreciate it. And also I think it's cool like that, you know, that Erica and we were paired together tonight to talk about stuff because we write really different things. And then that's another thing, which I think is cool about Lighthouse that different work kind of, you know, different writers can like talk across genre, or, you know, content. And so anyway, so I just like, thanks. It was great to hear you read. I'm really grateful for everyone who showed up. And um, yeah, so just thank you. Yeah, I, I agree the same way. It was fascinating. I feel like I could ask you a million more questions, Joanna, about like genre and stuff like that, what you're doing. So it's really interesting. And I love it. I, <clears throat> my only thing is I just wish that Lighthouse had been around when I was a kid. Like it's so frustrating on one hand because <clears throat> there was nothing in Denver as I was growing up. There was like, you know, Neil Cassidy and that myth. And that was it. Like that was a whole literary thing to be like, oh, Neil Cassidy. And like, yeah, but I mean, I want more. And then, you know, you sort of got up to the West Coast with like Wallace Stegner and everything like that. But in Denver, it was just such a barren thing. And then all of a sudden, when I leave, when I'm gone, the lighthouse pops up. <laughs> and so I just, I wish it was there because it's so awesome, you know, and there's so many good writers that are there. And I really enjoy this. I really appreciate this. So thank you. Thank you both for joining us tonight. And everybody who joined us on live here in the Zoom room or on Facebook. We really appreciate it. Um, and we will be back. Oh, I don't have my notes in front of me. I, I think April 23rd. You're gonna have to look on our website to see who the happy hour reading is though. But thank you both, Eric, Joanna. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, as things start to return in this hybrid or whatever the next thing looks like. I hope to see you guys uh, in person sometime soon. Yeah, me too. Likewise, I miss the mountains. Too, especially, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.